Shalom, my friends, uh, my Jewish brethren, uh, Christian friends that watch these videos as well. I bring you greetings. And I wanted to talk to you today a little bit about the Holy of Holies, the behind the veil and the representation. And you may find that in Judaism that we don't quite understand the significance of the Holy of Holies, but you may be surprised as Christian people that we understand that pretty well. And, but there's some things, though, uh, from my Jewish brethren that are watching this video that I want to share with you, some things that we really need to consider very deeply and very sincerely before Hashem, uh, the significance of the Holy of Holies. And I know that you, my brethren, you know this. And I want to just quote to you, though. Uh, first off, let me just say, we're going to go from the book of Exodus, Shemot, uh, chapter 25, verse 8. And I want to read to you, And you shall make a sanctuary for me that I may dwell among them. The question would be, in, in my mind, is why does Hashem, why does the Lord have to make a sanctuary in order to be able to dwell among us? It, with Adam and Eve, He was actually dwelling in them and not among them. And um, Jewish brothers, you know, uh, the blessed uh, Rabbi Or Chaim uh, ben Atar, uh, he's a Hasidic uh, commentary that wrote back in the mid-1700s on the Torah and the Tadach and the Midrash. But in, in something that I'd like to quote to you that he says, he asks why the Torah states, and you shall make a, a Mikdash, a Mikdash is a sanctuary, um, for me. And then in the, in, in the very next verse it says, the, for, uh, the form of the tabernacle, so shall you do, are we talking about the Mikdash, the sanctuary, or the Mishkan, the tabernacle? The Or Chaim, he writes that the commandment to make a Mikdash for Hashem is not only referring to the time when Bnei Yisrael, or the children of Israel, were in the desert, but includes all the Jewish history from the time that we were in the desert to the time that we entered uh, Eretz Yisrael, the land of Israel. Um, he writes that when the Jewish people are in the land of Israel, and even in the time of the Galut, the exile, uh, the mitzvah to build the Mikdash still applies. And something that uh, Rabbi uh, Hachaim had written about was that the human heart was the place in which God wish to dwell. And many of the other rabbis, uh, scholarly rabbis, have written that our heart is like the Holy of Holies. And even though we know that the um, Shekinah glory, which was the form in which God chose to take upon Himself that would come down in the Holy of Holies, this Spirit of, the Spirit of God wishes to dwell in human beings, in, in men and women. But the problem was, was this was hindered. Now, I know many of my Jewish brethren, you believe that, that God can dwell in the heart. And this is true, He can. But the thing is, is we have to go back and look in the law and see where problems went wrong. For, for example, why did we have to have a law in the first place? When God created our forefather and mother, Adam and Eve, there was no really law needed for them except just don't eat of this tree. That was the only thing that was given to them. And we see that when God created Adam, and I've mentioned this before on, on videos if you haven't seen them, but when God created Adam, He said He breathed into His nostrils the breath of life. Now we know in Hebrew it's Chaim. Why is Chaim, the life of Yahweh, the life of God, Hashem, why is this life in a plural form? It's because so that the Spirit of God could dwell in Him and could be divided out. And this is important. I want you to really catch this right here about that dividing out. Because uh, even, even the rabbis, uh, I've read the commentaries many times on this where we know that God calls Adam Ish. And the consensus of this is that his name is made from Ish and the divine letter Yod in there, making uh, the first letter of the divine name of Hashem. 
But the problem is, is we never have known quite why, but yet we take the idea, the rabbis have written that when God took from Adam from his side, and many translators translate that as rib, but it says he opened his side and taken from the ish, from the man, and created Eve. Uh, actually, it doesn't say Eve at the time, it calls her Isha. And of course, Isha spelled just like in Hebrew, it's Aleph, Shin, He. The, the He being the second letter in the divine name, and Ish being, um, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, Aleph, Yod, Shin. And in the middle of his name, the Yod being the first letter of the divine name, and when he created woman, the last letter of, of uh, is there, excuse me, the last letter in her name, the He, put them together, you have Yod, He, and now we have God. We have God written right in Hebrew, but the Aish is the word for fire. Now, I, I have mentioned too before that what is this? We, we, they know the rabbis say that if you take God out of the marriage, you have a consuming fire and it destroys. But I would like to bring to your attention that Moses at the burning bush, it was the Shekinah glory there. It says the angel of the Lord. The angel only represents, it's a messenger. It's the way God has chosen to come and identify himself to Moses because it was Hashem that spoke from the midst of the bush. Just like Adam's was called in the beginning, Ish. He gets his name Adam, and my brother, you, you know it, Adam, Adamah, from the ground. But the Ish comes from the fact that it was Yahweh, the spirit of Yahweh, the Shekinah, was dwelling within him. But he also breathed, when he put it in, when he put, when he made Adam, it was like the spiritual part of him was created from the, a part of the divine being of God. But when he made a body from Adamah, from the ground, he breathed into his nostrils, Chaim, or excuse me, his nostril, Chaim, life, pluralized, so that he could impart eternal life. And, and the word Chai, Chai comes from the divine name of God as well. That's why it's life. It's God's life. Uh, we know that animals can have life as well, but not in this case here. Nowhere do we find in the animals that God he says that he becomes a living soul. It's different. The animals just have Navesh. You know, but it's not as different with Adam. He was something altogether different. And when he made Eve, she was taken from his side. God torn from Adam, took part of his side, and made Eve. Now, interesting though, when the fall comes, we find out that what happens here. When the fall comes, Adam and Eve, they partake of the fruit they were told not to take of. And when God comes to them, he's asking you know, who told you you were naked? They realize they're naked. The serpent has beguiled Eve, uh, to make a long story short. But uh, when he goes, comes to Eve, he says to her, what is this that you've done? Because Adam is passing the buck. And he said, the woman you gave me, she, she made me do this. And so he asked her, what did you do? And then God begins to prophesy to her. And he says to her, your husband shall rule over you and your desire shall be to him. You know, brothers, that should tell us right away that if God, God is not instituting a doctrinal way that the man is to rule over his wife, but he's letting her know, because why? She is a weaker vessel. She is more, she's the feminine side. She is his bride. Just as we are the bride of Hashem, if we are the bride of Hashem, we are the feminine, we are the weaker, and Hashem is the stronger. If he didn't have his own spirit of life that can govern the world, what would he do with us? Just kill us all. And because we take the life of God out of Adam and Eve, when they fell, it shows they lost the indwelling of the spirit of Almighty God that should have been in them. And it's obvious because God said your husband's going to rule over you and, and your desire shall be to him. Her desire had to have been to Hashem to begin with. How could God say this if it wasn't? And then he speaks about her bringing forth children. And I know we, we translate it as children, but brothers, you know, I mean, and it's perfectly okay to tr translate uh, um, Benim as children, but you know, literally it means sons. Tell Adim Benim, you shall birth sons. And what do we have? And he says that they would bring her sorrow and pain. And it's not of, of a flesh 
pain and sorrow, but a pain and agony of her heart. And certainly when she has her sons, she loves them both, but one rises up and kills the other one. Now, I find this fascinating that Adam, after the fall, gives Eve the name of Chava. Eve we say in English, but Chava is how you say it in Hebrew. And it does, it, we, we translate that generally as mother of the living, uh, or mother of all living. But if you'll notice in the Cha, or the part that would be life, the Yod is missing from the life. She can bring forth the natural life, because God had already given them the command to populate and replenish the earth. But the problem is, there is no life of Yahweh to be imparted to the people. This is why we have God coming down and commanding. He would come and dwell uh, among us the best he could. With Abraham, he gave the promise and, and told him that he, you know, they bring forth a son. This is why that when God comes down in the Garden of Eden and he has to take after the fall and he sacrifices a lamb and puts the bloody skins upon them and as they walk out of the garden, that bloody skins beating across the backs of their legs. Because God had said in his word, that day you do, mot to mot, you shall surely die. And spiritually they lost that life right there. But the thing is, is he loved us so much. He did not want to lose his creation that he'd placed his life in. But he, you know, the, the Christian people say when you sin, you grieve the spirit of God. And they believe that the, the spirit of God can dwell within you as well. But you grieve the spirit of God and the spirit of God pull, takes his flight back. Because he won't dwell inside an unclean vessel. And our blessed rabbis, how many times have we read these things where they say to us that our hearts should be cleansed and sanctified so that Chaim, excuse me, so that uh, the Spirit of God can dwell within us. But we're trying to bring this about by law, and it's not the way God intended it. The law was there put in our, it's our schoolmaster, is to help us to know how to behave before the, before the sight of God so he can even be around us. But you're right. God intends to dwell in our hearts. Now, if God could just come and reside in our heart, th then why did he say in Exodus 25 to build me a sanctuary so I could dwell among them? He provided a sacrifice because... The only problem is, though, the sacrifice, it could die, the life could go out as a temporary substitute, but the life of the animal could not come back upon us, and it could not come in us. And God don't want the life of the animal in us anyway. But he said, the penalty for sin is death, so he had to kill something that was innocent as a type, as a foreshadow of what he would do. Why does Isaiah then say in 43, in chapter 44, I have created him, I have formed him. Speaking of Mashiach. And the reason why God has to create him is because Adam, the first man that ever was created and formed by God, he put that life inside of him. Chaim, the life that was intended to come upon every one of our children to dwell inside us, the Shekinah, the Spirit of God dwelling inside of us. It was meant to be this way, but it was lost. It was lost back in the Garden of Eden. And then God took and He brought the law and He brought the sacrifices. He built the temple. He had Moses first build it with tents and He put the Holy of Holies and the Shekinah could come and be around us and with us, but He couldn't be in us. How could He be in us? The blood, the, 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 the life of the blood of the bulls and goats could not come back upon us. God had to again form another Adam. And he had to be created. He had to be formed. So we struggle with this idea whether or not Jesus was Mashiach. And a lot of times he's just cast off. He's, he's not Mashiach. Because the Christians, and not all Christians, but some Christians try to make it some other God. But many Christians know that it was, it was Hashem manifested in a human being. And then we try to tell them that, you know, how can Hashem, how can God be created? How could he, he be a man? 
Did he not appear to Moses and he saw the backside of a man? Did he not come down to Abraham? Did Abraham not see three angels walk up to him and one of them he, uh, Moses identified as Hashem that spoke to him that knew the secrets of the heart? And then when Jesus, that man, he came on the earth, did he not know the secrets of the heart? That should have been the sign. The woman, the woman at the well, when he said, come see a man that told us everything, everything I ever did. We know that when Messiah, when Mashiach comes, he will do this. He will know the secrets of the heart. How did she know that? Because she knew what the rabbis had said about Abraham. When the three came, two went down to Sodom, but that one that stayed with Abraham, he knew the secrets of Abraham's heart and Sarah's heart. But my brethren, if Adam, God had committed the Chaim in him, and he was able to impart it onto his wife, to Eve, and to give her part of that life of God, and that was lost, and we can see from, from the results of the fall that it was lost, then how else is God going to take and redeem us, except not just bring Mashiach, Mashiach has to come, and Mashiach has to have that life that Adam had living inside of him. So God had to create him and form him, as Isaiah. But here's the point I want to bring about about the Holy of Holies. I was reading this, and this is what anointed my heart. I was reading from the Jewish writer. And he's, you know, come on. It was the Jewish brethren that wrote the book called the Christian Bible, what we call the Christian Bible. They call it the New Testament. But what, let me read to you something that is just will blow you away. For when God made a promise to Abraham, this is Paul writing this letter to our people, trying to persuade us of something here. Because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely, blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply you. And so after he had uh, patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men indeed swear by the greater. An oath for confirmation is for them an end of all dispute. Thus God determining to show more abundantly to the elders a promise of immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who fled for refuge to lay hold on the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, in which enters in the presence behind the veil. Come on. Chaim ben Atar, Rabbi, Rabbi, you know, Ravi, he, he, said, he says the same thing, you know, that is, the Shekinah is dwelling behind the veil. We know that. Presence behind the veil. Wherefore the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, brothers, come We have no record of Jesus going in behind the veil. But according to the historical documentation, not just the Bible, but even historical documentation, Jesus, when he was placed on that cross, he was torn. His side was opened up as well. We struggle. You've seen the videos maybe that I've written about the rock. We, we, we struggle with why does Moses write uh, Hatsua, the rock? Why does he write Hatsua? Because it, it's a specific rock. We know that Isaiah and both David said that it was, Hashem was that, was that rock. Uh, the mighty God, Elohim, was that rock. Not literally Hashem, the divine name, was the rock, because there again, it's like the word Elohim means in the first place. Elohim is not several gods. The only reason it's pluralized is it's, it's showing the uh, Elohim expresses the attribute or the manifestation of Hashem in different forms. Elohim is what we see when it says, the uh, Bereshit bara Elohim. In the beginning, God created the earth. Why Elohim? It was God manifested somehow. Whether he was in the Shekinah glory would be my own thinking. He was in Shekinah glory form at that time is when God created the heavens and the earth. And we know that if it's a singular verb or adjective, it expresses one God. So it doesn't mean that there were two gods there. We know that. But it was Hashem inside, inside whatever form he was at the time he was creating. 
Elohim was the one that spoke to Moses at the burning bush. We see that it was Yahweh, but he came down as Elohim. In other words, as an angel, a messenger. In the, that was the Shekinah because it was a fire. The bush was a fire. We know that, a flame, a fire. It was Elohim when he spoke to Abraham. And then we have, we read in the record that this Jesus says, when, when our forefathers were asking him, I don't even, it's a disgrace that this happened, but anyway, they said to him, you're a man not over 50 years old and you say you've seen Abraham. You know, sometimes I wonder if they didn't have a little bit better revelation or knowledge at least that Hashem, he was claiming that Hashem was in him. And it had to be like Adam. He had to be created in form. And it had to be the life of Almighty God living inside of him. Because the only way we're ever going to get Hashem living inside of us, the Spirit of God living in our hearts, is we're going to have to get it His provided way. The sacrifices, all we do are the bulls and blood of the goats and everything else. Isn't that life is never going to come back upon us. We have to have the life of God to come upon us. And these are just substitutes. Something has to come and take our sins far away. That's why I, I challenge you that when the two, uh, when the two goats were, were came up, one was a scapegoat and one was the goat that was sacrificed. Jesus was the only one that could, uh, according to the, to the documentation, that was able to lay his life down and raise it back up again. And in that case there, he was able to take our sins very far away from God. What we had done to him, he was able to bear that iniquity as the scapegoat and take it from the presence of Almighty God. Otherwise, we would have died. But you know, the record says that when he died, the veil of the temple was rent or split right down the middle. Why was that veil rent? It's because he was torn. The Roman soldier took the spear and when he stabbed it into his side and the water came out and the blood came out, it was showing that the life of God was being released. The water was only a sign to let us know that it bore record before God that the water that came out of his side was a type of the water that came out of the rock that fed our brothers. In the, in the desert, when they were complaining and saying, is God among us? And here we were, right at the time when Jesus was there, not us, we're not guilty, neither was Benjamin guilty when Joseph was sold out, but yet we are, we're, we borne the blame. Why did Joseph have, have the cup put in Benjamin's bag? Benjamin wasn't guilty, but he put it in his bag. It's because it was a sign to us that we had rejected our Mashiach ben David at the time of the communion when Judas took and rejected him. But that water that came from his side was showing, like he said to the woman at the well, I give you water that you don't have to come here to drink. And he was speaking of the Spirit of God that was inside of him. That it's soon he was going to be able to impart that eternal life like Adam was able to impart life into his wife, Eve, Isha. And when the veil was rent, it was showing that veil was just split like that, just wide open. And the Holy of Holies come in plain view. We couldn't look at the Holy of Holies unless we were the high priest. It was instant death. And when that veil was rent, it was showing as as Adam was torn as well, he was, his side was taken off to make his bride, Eve. And when the veil was rent, it was showing that right before us was our sacrifice for our sins. And he was being torn and he was being opened up in order to release the Shekinah. And when that veil was rent, it showed that the Shekinah glory come from the temple. It was no longer in the temple. It was showing that he wasn't there, but he was in the one that we were killing, our sacrifice. And my brethren, listen to me. We had to do that. Don't take it as a bad thing. It's not a bad thing that we took and offered up Jesus as a sacrifice. This is why we are a chosen people. We're not chosen because we're preferred. As a brother said to me one time, he sent me a little message on my YouTube video and he said, preferred doesn't mean that, we're, that the Jews are better. 
And I was amazed at what he said, because when he said it, I realized, you know, you're right. It's not that we're better. We were chosen for a particular purpose as a priestly nation to offer the sacrifice for sin. That is why God has not imputed the sin to us. And this is why Jesus, being a true brother to us, like Joseph, he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. God, have mercy. That veil was rent and split to show that God that was inside this man. Hashem was inside this man, that life like Adam. And he was being torn so that that life could come back upon us. That's the only sacrifice that could ever be offered where the life could come back so that it could dwell within us. Like Adam was put into a deep sleep in order for God to take from him that life and put it into Eve and create a human being, a, a, ma a mate for him. So Jesus, he was put into a deep sleep, death as we would call it. And it was death. He had to die. He had to pay. He had mot to mot. He had to surely die. But he was the only one that had the ability to come back and bring that life back to us. And he proved it when we see the record that he came and he resurrected from the grave. And not long after that, what happened on the day of Pentecost? They were sitting in the upper room and a Russian mighty wind came in and cloven tongues like unto a fire rested upon each one of them. There's some artist one time shows in there like flames of fire over the top of their head, like a lick. I don't know how to exactly make that for you, but like a lick of fire. There's your Aish. And what was in that Aish? It was Hashem, the Spirit of Almighty God, the Shekinah. And they were filled, the Bible says. They were filled according to the Christian Bible. This is how we get the Spirit of God dwelling in us. We have to accept that sacrifice. And the time has come. And soon is at hand that our people will believe this. We say, Baruch Haba, blessed is the coming. And blessed is his coming. For we shall believe. And we will cause much shame to come upon the Gentiles of today that are now rejecting him and yet confessing they believe in him. God bless you.